Hello, pray and cheer warriors. Sorry I yawned on the phone. I'm really not tired. I'm kind of laughing at myself. I made made my own teleprompter for tonight. And uh, so if you see me looking up, that's what I'm doing. I'm reading. Um, because I have these sheets. But I don't want to be looking down all the time. I'm trying to learn some new things. This is what happens when you're not really professional and you're just kind of winging it. And uh, so you just make yourself stuff. That's one of the gifts that God has given me is that um, he gave me an inventive mind. Um, so I'm using my inventive mind tonight. Well, I hope that y'all had an awesome Friday. It is Friday. It has been raining here in my hometown. And um, my name is Charm again, and this is my ministry. I feel like God has called me to this ministry to share His truths and the gospel of Jesus. Excuse me. I'm sorry that I wasn't here last night, but I was getting some much-needed training in an area that I feel like God is calling me to. And since I decided to follow what I felt like he was calling me to, it's just all falling into place so quickly. And um, I will talk about this maybe one night next week. i will, I got to find out what I can say and what I can't say. I don't want to mess things up. So, but what I want to talk to you about tonight is God always keeps his promises. Because I've been thinking a lot about trust. And so God and I have, in my quiet time, been talking about trust. Oh, my. My teleprompter wants to go south. Like, somewhere else. There we are. It wants to go somewhere else. Sorry. Anyway, it's, it's not a screen. It's like... Um one of those magnetic boards with my sheet um, under a magnet. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. When you don't have a fancy teleprompter like the government has, you just have to do what you have to do. So anyway, I wanna talk to you about God always keeps his promises. Um, to me, that is what has grown my trust uh, for God knowing that he is going to do what he says he's going to do. And um, anyway, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I may read both days of my quiet time with God because we have been talking about trust and he's been asking me questions. When did you start trusting me? You know, and I guess my answer to him was, it has grown over the years. It wasn't an overnight thing, you know, and uh, I really couldn't pinpoint the day or the time that I just really started trusting him with, like, everything. Like, okay, you can have it all. I, you know, whatever. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, um, you just have it all. I don't have much money, but he knows that, but that's okay. He knows that I use what I can for to further his ministry. I mean, to further his kingdom. <laughs> it's a kingdom. It's not a ministry for him. It is a full-blown kingdom. So, anyway. All right. I am going to pray, and then uh, we will get into some... Bible study, and I'll, part of this is my testimony. Um, this was a very big impact in a time where I started trusting, maybe more, was the what I'm going to read you today. Okay, I hope my sound is up. Okay, it is. I never know. Sometimes I turn it down. Okay, well, let's jump into some prayer. God, we just thank you, and I just praise you for this time, God, that I can come, and through the Holy Spirit, I can share 
parts of my testimony and uh, the things that you've done in my life, God, the times that you've been there, the times that I've felt your presence, God. I just praise you and thank you. You are the great I am. You are the great Jehovah. You are my creator, my sustainer, my provider, my protector. God, you are my shelter in the storm. God, you are the righteous judge that will come and judge all unrighteousness. But God, too, you are waiting on your children to be saved through Jesus. So you are kind and compassionate and loving and patient. And you're just waiting. God, all your promises are kept. All your prophecies will be fulfilled. God, we know that Jesus could come tonight. God, we are thankful and we are grateful for all the many things that you do. We just pray that you would open the eyes and the ears of the lost, God. That you would soften their hearts. That you would allow the Holy Spirit to draw them to Jesus so they could be saved. We pray for the prodigals to come home, God. We just pray for them to see where they are. For them to repent, for them to return to you, God. We pray for all the disasters. I'm, I'm sure things happen today. I am not aware of much today, but I'm sure things happened. So God, we just pray that you would be with these people. I found out today, because I'm not staying on top of things, that... Um, our brother in Christ and our church member, my church member family that I've known for a long time, that played the organ for us every Sunday, God. He is with Jesus now. He is with you. But God, I missed his funeral today. And I hate that. But I didn't know about it until this afternoon. Didn't know it was going to be so quickly. So God, we, I just pray that you would be with his family, that you would give them peace, comfort, and strength. Be with us as a church family because we are going to miss his presence. We missed it last Sunday when he wasn't there. There's going to be a, an empty organ bench on Sunday. But God, we know that he is with you. And so just remind us that he will never be sick again. His hearing has been restored to perfection. And that if y'all have organs in heaven, God, I know he's playing them. God, we just praise you, God, that there is a better ending for us when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, my friends. My pray and share warriors. Okay, well, I wrote this lesson. Um, I think in 2018. Or maybe 2017. No, it must have been 2018. Because uh, when we had our ladies tea that year... Our theme was the promises of God. So I asked them if I could speak. And this is why I asked them if I could speak. Um, but I want you to know something that God feels for you that maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't feel. God planned you. He loves you. And he has a purpose for you. And God always keeps his promises. So I made a promise to God at Ignite 2017, which is a it's kind of a ladies conference at um, Stonewater in Granbury that we went to for several years. So we were asked to lay down our biggest fear 
on the altar to lay it down before God, lay down our biggest fear. And so I felt like, and had felt like for a long time, that God was calling me to um, public speaking, which at that time was my fear. And so I wrote it down on paper and put it on the altar and prayed. We all prayed about each other's, you know, fear, whatever. And so I prayed all of 2016. Uh, Ignite happens in January. I prayed all of 2016. God, open a door, open a door. Um, but he didn't open a door. And so I really didn't understand um, at the time, but now I do because God's timing is always perfect. And he was preparing me. He took a whole year preparing me. And he has been preparing me more since, since 2018. He has been preparing me more for this calling because I have done so much more since then. So I didn't understand. And then in 2018, when I went to Ignite again, I had already, he had already opened the door and I had already accepted to speak at Our Lady's Tea before I went to Ignite 2018. So our speaker was Lisa Harper. And her topic was Abraham and the promise of God. The promise God made to him. And so that was my confirmation because I knew what the I knew what the theme was. I knew, you know, promise just kept, you know, confirming over and over. So, you know, the story of Abraham, you know, God promised him he left his land and went to an unknown land and God promised him so many things. So our theme was the promises of God. And so I found this verse that I really like. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. So these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So that's uh, 2 Peter 1, 4. So I thought that was a really good verse, you know, that I could start that off with. I have to move my paper up. So God made thousands of promises in the Bible that have all been kept. God keeps his promises. Every promise in here has been kept. So, um, how many of you can say that you have broken a promise? I have broken promises before. <clears throat> so, raise your hand wherever you are. Uh, you probably have to. So, it hurts when we break a promise and when one is broken to us. I've had promises broken to me, too. Uh, not by God. And I said, I think Satan just waits until we say, I promise, and tries his best to put obstacles in our way to break them. And I believe that because the promise is an important, it's like an oath, it's an important thing to God. So we have some awesome examples that God has kept, awesome examples of promises that God has kept in the Bible with Abraham, Noah, Moses, Joshua, and then there is the story of Hannah, which brings me to my first point. Okay, this also is part of my testimony that I was giving, and so that's why I chose Hannah, and I thought tonight, I'm going to skip the story of Hannah. 
The story of Hannah is so good that I'm not. I need a new teleprompter. And I wonder if the government would send me one. Oh, I doubt that. Okay, so the ex to experience God's promises, we must have faith and be obedient. And because if we are not sticking close to God, if we are not doing the things that God is calling us to do, then we're not going to see those promises fulfilled. So, have you ever made a deal with God, praying, God, if you will just give me this or that, um, I'll do this. You know, we've, we've done that before. I used to do that when I was younger. I don't do that anymore. I just pray. I pray and wait for God's will because His will is always, always better than mine. And His timing is always more perfect. Okay, so that's what Hannah did. Hannah in the Bible. Hannah had great faith in God and was obedient. So the story of Hannah is found in 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 19. I think we'll read it. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, I did. This God wanted me to read it because I've already found it. 1 Samuel 1. One through nineteen. Okay. Now there was a certain man of Ramathium Zophim. I have no idea if I pronounced that correctly. I'm not going to put this on my teleprompter. It would all fall. It would all go to the floor. Okay. Um, of Mount Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife, and to all of her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. So he gave Hannah more. He gave Hannah more than Penina, even though Penina had all these sons and daughters for him. He gave Hannah more, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, so she couldn't have babies. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So Penina... Um, made fun of her you know daily she ridiculed her and as he did so year by year when she went up to the to the house of the lord so she provoked her and therefore she wept and did not eat so hannah hannah being provoked did not eat and she wept then said elkanah her husband to her hannah why weepest thou and why eatest thou not and why is thy, thy heart grieved? Am, am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Then now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow which is a promise. She vowed a vow and said, 
O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon, look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Uh-oh. I gotta get my phone plugged in. Excuse me. Intermission break. That's annoying. You can tell I'm not very professional. Oh. All right. Let's get back to our story. My teleprompter may go this time. Let's see if I can get it to stand up. Okay. All right, well now we've just got kind of a canopy of paper, but it's okay. Okay, this is a great story. I'm so glad that I decided to go ahead and read it. Okay, that the Holy Spirit led me to read it. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, uh, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight, so the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned, and came to their house to Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So, okay. But Hannah made God a promise. Papers in the way. Hannah made God a promise. Maybe I can fold it back like that. So, um, Hannah was married to Elkanah, and he, but he had another wife, also named Penina. Penina had sons and daughters, but Hannah was barren and had to endure daily ridiculing and teasing by Penina. Uh, yearly, Elkanah, Penina, her children, and Hannah would go to Shiloh to the temple to take their offering to Eli the priest and pray. Elkanah would give Penina and all her sons a portion of the offering, but he always gave Hannah the most, for he loved Hannah, but God had shut up her womb. Okay, time to change my piece of paper. Sorry, this is kind of like old-timey, um, what was that? That we used to do in school that the kids nowadays don't even know um, the projector the it wasn't called the projector it was called something else I'm sure people my age know what I'm talking about overhead projector it was an overhead projector okay so um, so daily monthly and yearly Hannah wanted the same thing a son a man child have any of you ever felt the way Hannah did in wanting a baby, but you weren't able to? You weren't able to get pregnant. I know many women struggle with this. Um, I can empathize with Hannah on this subject. I think some of you can also. Year after year, when they went to Shiloh, Panana teased and provoked Hannah. So Hannah would not eat and wept. Elkanah asked Hannah what was wrong with her and got a little indignant about asking her if he was not better than ten sons. 
So the scripture says in 1 Samuel 1, 11, Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And so Eli, Eli told her that uh, Eli, seeing that she was genuinely praying to God, told her to go in peace and that the God of Israel uh, grant your petition you have asked of him. Okay, this basically is, I didn't realize that I printed the story out. And so I'm not going to reread all of it. Okay. Hannah gave birth to a son, and they named him Samuel, which means, I have asked him of the Lord because that's what she did she asked God for this son she kept her promise to God and he blessed her in Elkanah with more children so Hannah when uh, Samuel got old enough she took Samuel back to the temple so that he could be raised at the temple mm, by I think Eli It's a pretty long story. I'm not going to read it all. But basically, she kept her promise. She did because Samuel is one of the prophets in the Bible. Okay, so Samuel lived in the temple with Eli and became a very important priest. And stories can be found about him in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hannah's prayer was answered because she had great faith and was obedient. When God gives us specific, a specific promise, it requires trust, which leads me to my second point today. So my first point was, to experience God's promises, we must have faith and be obedient. Hannah was both had faith and she was obedient. And you know what? She was consistent too. Because year after year, she would go and she would pray the same thing. So we'll give her a bonus word. She was consistent. So to experience God's promised promises, we must trust his specific plan. So this is more of my story. So my husband and I got married when I was 40. And we wanted to have a baby, but after trying for over two years, like Hannah, I seemed to be barren. You know, I, I couldn't get pregnant. So I do have a daughter from my first marriage. And uh, she was 16 at this time. And she had been asking for a sibling since she was five. Yeah. So she was ready for a sibling. She did not want to be an only child. Um... So I finally got pregnant and we were really happy. We were so happy. We felt like this was going to be a boy. So we named him Isaiah. We already named this baby. So my pregnancy was great until one day at work, I was looking through some boxes. I picked up a heavy one. You know, we forget. We forget we're pregnant when we're pregnant. And so um, about an hour later, I started spotting. And I was so upset. I had never had a miscarriage before. So I was sitting outside praying to God about my pains, my bleeding, crying and pleading to, for him to save our baby. So I was at work when this happened. So it wasn't something I could go crawl in my bed. I had to go back to work. Um... Oh, I smell place. 
So I went back inside and I sat down at my desk and very clearly I heard God say, you will have your baby. Those words, you will have your baby. Not you will have another baby, but you will have your baby. So that just made me so happy, you know, because I thought, all right, I did not miscarriage this baby. Because I thought he meant that I was going, I was not going to lose Isaiah, but sadly I did. And sadly I did have a miscarriage. So I did miscarry Isaiah, and it was like a death with no funeral. You know, there's no body, there's no funeral, there's no, but it's death. It's death, and there is grief. And I really did not understand why God told me what he did and I still lost my baby and that was like July of 2002 so it's been a while let me scroll my sheets up this is not working great I was going to do this for another project but uh, probably not this won't stand up I have something heavy back there, but apparently not heavy enough. Okay. Nobody move. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I'm going to be honest. I was a little bit mad at God. I have, I have spent time being mad at God before, like wasting my time because, you know, it's all his point and purpose anyway. So we decided to try again, and after a few months, I was pregnant, pregnant again. And uh, we found out early in January of 2003. So I was so scared to do anything. So I took it easy. I didn't do nothing. I didn't pick up anything. Um, when we went to have the first sonogram, the doctor told us, um, we needed to speak with a genetic specialist because they discovered markers of Down syndrome. And so the meeting had so much information that I did not even understand. You know, a lot of it I didn't, I didn't understand. Neither one of us had any special needs family members, so we just really, you know, we just, it was just, you know, more than we could understand. So, the doctor told us after the meeting that we could terminate if we wanted, but we... We're Christians, and we were both appalled at that, you know, and we go, no. We'll take whatever God gives us, we will take, and we will gladly raise. And so, um, so we decided to name this baby Seth, which I found out from a lovely lady in our church that I admire so much been such an encourager in my Christian uh, journey, my Christianity journey, and she told us that Seth means granted, and Seth was granted. We prayed Seth into existence, and our prayers were granted. So Seth was born on... Um, one reason why we named him Seth is because it's the only name that we, none of the three of us vetoed, me, my husband, and my daughter. We were all sitting around the table throwing out names. Nobody vetoed Seth. Everybody vetoed other names that came up, but nobody vetoed Seth, so we stayed with Seth. Um, and so... Seth was born on August 25th of 2003, 825.03. <laughs> I know that because I take him to the doctor so much. 
Sometimes I think that's my birthday when I'm filling out forms. I think, oh, no, it's not my birthday. Um, so he was born in Fort Worth. So I felt like this child fulfilled God's promises. Uh, God's promise, you know, that he gave me that you will have your baby. You know, I felt like that was a fulfillment to the promise. And so Seth was born with a lot of medical issues as a lot of special needs Down syndrome kids are. And so he had oxygen problems. He couldn't keep his oxygen up. Um, he was on oxygen for a while. And so he was born at Sarah at Harris Southwest. But they um, they didn't have what they needed to get him the medical help that he needed. So they sent him to Cook's. So the first night he was at Cook's, we met with our neonatologist. I don't even know if that's what they call him anymore. Um, Dr. Brin. And he told us that he had sent a blood test off to determine what type of Down syndrome. And um, he explained other medical issues that needed to be addressed, like Seth had three holes in his heart when he was born, and his intestines were malrotated, and his appendix was in the wrong spot. So, um, And he needed a feeding tube. He had to have a feeding tube put in um, so he could drink more formula because he, he wasn't drinking enough. So one day on my way to Cook's to visit Seth, um, I went into Dollar General and on the way I found this and I meant to bring it in here. It's a little teddy bear and it says God keeps his promises. So, I, uh, I bought that, and I put it at the end of his crib, because to me, when I would look at that, I would remember that promise that God made me, and uh, during the two months, Seth stayed at the NICU for it was called the NICU back then, but now it's called the NICU. So he stayed at the NICU for two months. He lived there. He lived at the NICU. And sadly, we had a teenager at home, so we would go and visit him on the weekends. Um, we would call during the week to see how he was doing and everything. And... Um, Seth um, had he had to have two surgeries so the night before his first surgery there was a grandmother that was in the NICU or the NICU and she was singing to her um, I don't know whether it's a boy or girl little baby grandchild and um, I was sitting there I was like because she sang a bunch of Disney songs, you know, and I was like, oh, I don't want to hear that. So she started singing this song, and I go, what is that song? It's so familiar. And so it finally dawned on me. He's got the whole world in his hands. And so instantly... You know, peace just flooded over me. And so God, this is how God speaks to me in many ways, is by confirmations and messages of peace. And so he sent me that confirmation because I was so worried about putting Seth. I mean, Seth was two weeks old. I was so worried 
about it until he sent me that. So I knew that God had this surgery in his very capable hands. He even sent me a picture in the NICU of huge hands holding a baby, holding a little bitty baby. And so Seth came through the surgery great, but was still struggling to breathe. His oxygen level was still down. But he got his intestines got re-rotated, you know, rotated in the right place. They took his appendix out and they put a feeding tube in him. So they did all that in that first surgery. And so So Seth was nearly strong enough to come home at the five week point. And I want to tell you something. As a mom, getting up every morning and looking at an empty crib and knowing that your child is not in that crib for you to care for is heartbreaking. So moms and dads, I know how you feel when your babies are in the NICU and you cannot take care of them. You can go and visit them, but you can't take care of them. I know how that feels. I'm more than sympathize. I empathize with that feeling. That is a horrible feeling of not having your child at home. So I was ready. I was ready for my baby to come home. And so at the five week point, we were so excited because they were saying, yeah, he can come back in six months. He's doing so much better. And we will fix the holes in his heart. We got it. We got it. It's going to be awesome. We're going to let you go home. And then the cardiologist decided to meet about it. The cardiology uh, team. He had a team. He had a cardiologist team. And so He told us that Seth could come home soon and they would do his surgery in six months. I was so excited. Then another cardiologist on that team called us one Sunday afternoon and said, we have an opening tomorrow morning to fit Seth in to get his heart repaired. Maybe they had a cancellation. I don't know. I was like, no. I want my baby home. I want my baby home. I'll give my baby up in six months. This is like at the two month mark, really. It would only be four months. I was like, I want my baby home. I want to bring my, I was mad. I was so mad. And I kind of argued with them because I do that. I'm a mom and I argue with doctors sometimes. Um, and so my husband, which a lot of times is not on my side, probably a good thing. Oh, this is, this is a pitiful setup. I don't know why that won't hold that up. It's heavy. It must be heavier. It must be heavier in that position. Okay, so sorry about that. I'll, I might get me a teleprompter. I might look into it. Okay, so uh, I didn't pull that up enough. So because my husband and my daughter and all these people were like, yeah, this is great. Let's get this done. You know, and I got mad at him. And I go, I don't want to do this. I want my baby home. I'm tired of getting up every morning and looking at an empty crib. I want my baby home. And so, so Ricky said, you know, okay, if you think that is best. But what I did not see is what God was doing for Seth. See, it was never my plan. None of this was my plan. I wanted my baby at home. I wanted to have a baby. 
not have as much trouble as I had having that baby and bring my baby home after a few days. And I know a lot of mothers get to do that. Well, I have never had that luxury, but it's too late. I'm not even going there anymore. But I've never experienced just taking my baby home. I've had some medical issues with both of them. Okay. So, um, the doctors knew that winter was coming and that Seth might not make it through the winter with his weakened heart. See, they, they were looking out for Seth. I was being selfish. So God opened a door for surgery to help Seth get stronger faster. So we decided to do it. So we packed up our stuff and went to church that night on our way to Fort Worth. I'm not going to cry. So we shared with our church family, which had been praying, had been praying through the pregnancy, had been praying through everything. Um what we were going to do. I don't know if I can get through this or not. I can. And so our pastor at the time prayed the most beautiful prayer that Seth and our, for about Seth and our family for God to surround him with his angels. And we also sang that night. He's got the whole world in his hands. God is intentional about his messages for us. I'm just going to put this over here. Oh, I can't. Yeah, okay, that's better. I'm just going to have to see that I'm looking over here because I'm tired of fighting with this up here. Okay, so Seth, when we got there, I am not lying. I never saw that sheet on any baby bed. I never saw that sheet after this night. It's going to give you chills. It gives me chills every time. When we got to the NICU that night, Seth was laying on a sheet that was blue and it had angels all over it. So all the time we were there, you know, I never saw him. And, and afterwards either, it was just that one night, that one night, it felt like a miracle. It did. Seriously. God literally showed me angels that he had surrounding our baby. Mm. So we got to stay, you know, I know Cook's is different now. You can like stay with your kid. Well, it wasn't back then. You couldn't stay with your kid. But if they had a major surgery early the next morning, they would let you room with your kid. So that was kind of like my deal. Okay, I want something for doing this because I don't want to do it. But I was pretty convinced by the time we got here. And then I saw the angels on the sheet. And I was very convinced that, you know, things were going to be okay. We sang he's got the whole world in his hands. I mean, that threw back to that first th surgery. So, okay, when we got to that room the night and we stayed with Seth all night. This was the first time in nearly two months we got to stay together. So Seth did great on his surgery. They, why is my phone dying? Oh no. I thought, all right. I may lose you, Facebook. I don't know why my phone is dying. I thought I plugged it in. Maybe I, it got unplugged. All right, so if this Facebook thing turns off, then I will finish it later. 
but my YouTube thing doesn't have anything to do with face with my phone. It's on my computer. Okay, so all right, so Seth did great. He did so great. Seth did so great that you still can't see the holes in his heart. But Seth does have a leaky mitral valve that we go every year to get checked on it. EKG and echo. So, he did great. He just had colds and like simple things for four and a half years after that surgery. So, I was so thankful that God opened the door for that surgery since everything went so great. But part of my fear was from someone else's story. And so that was part of my fear for not wanting him to have surgery. I wasn't sure he was going to make it through it. Okay, so um, Seth did really good. Um, then, when Seth was five and a half, well, actually, he did really good for like five years when Seth was five and a half. He started just like having these infections that I could not explain. He just had infections. He was having jaw pain. He was, and he's nonverbal, so it's not like he can tell me where he hurts. Where do you hurt? Do you hurt? Yes, this is hurt. Yes, he hurts. Okay, but where do you hurt? Well, I hurt here. You know, he would have ear infections. He would have, you know, upper respiratory infections. Sometimes in the morning, he would just have a fever. And I now know what all those things point to, but I didn't know then, so I was trying to get answers, just constantly trying to get answers and taking him to the doctor, putting him on antibiotics, putting him on ibuprofen because the dentist said that was good for cutting teeth. And so I was doing everything that I possibly could do. But this pain that he had started getting consistently worse. I'm, I'm going off book now because that's not covered on that. So this pain got constantly worse. And so the night before on June the 13th, that night, it was a Saturday. I'll never forget it. Well, I'm, I don't know, I probably will, but anyway, I'll try not to forget it. <laughs> anyway, he, um, he was in a lot of pain, and I just, I didn't know what to do for him. I gave him some ibuprofen, figured it was ear, you know, upper respiratory. You know, sometimes he would get croup. You know, croup is something that he would get. Um, but he was uncomfortable until about 2 o'clock in the morning. He finally fell asleep. So when I went to bed, I prayed. I said, God, please, please do not let this pain, Seth be having this pain tomorrow. I want to go to church. And so I went to sleep, and I guess he did too. And uh, I woke up the next morning, and I was fixing my coffee, and I was drinking my coffee, and I was going, God, please don't let Seth wake up with pain. I want to go to church today. And uh, immediately, just like that voice that said, you'll have your baby, that same voice said, Sometimes pain is a sign of something a whole lot worse. And so, I knew where I was taking my son. And I love this town. I have taken him to the ER here, but I knew where to go. So, I woke Ricky up and I said, get up, eat something. 
Seth said, I'm feeding Seth right now. I'm going to eat something because it may be a long day. I said, there's something wrong with this child. Either he has a blocked intestine or something is wrong with him. And I said, we're going to Cook's. Because we'll get answers. Because they have a specialist in every field. And I knew we would get answers. I'm sorry, I'm usually a lot stronger than this. But we've had a church family death and my, my emotions are a little close to the surface. So we were there, we got there early that morning, and we were there all day. They were doing tests on Seth, they were doing blood tests, they were doing echoes, they were doing EKGs, they were doing um, sonic, you know, ultrasounds, they were doing everything, they were trying to find out what was wrong with him. Of course, I don't have a Kleenex in here. Anyway. listen to those voices because I'm glad that I did listen I'm glad I did not ignore that voice so again I was feeling very helpless and again, I did not know what was wrong with our son. So that afternoon, that afternoon, the ER doctor said, okay, we think we know what's wrong with him. He goes, we did a blood smear instead of a blood test. And he said, we think he has leukemia. And so, I felt like somebody had kicked me in the gut. Because what I knew about leukemia was a death sentence. Because when I was a little girl, the funeral owner's daughter died of leukemia. And she was a little girl. So what I knew was not good. And my husband, I just went to the bathroom. I couldn't even cry. I just wanted to scream. I wanted to kick things. I was so upset. Because what I knew wasn't good. And I felt like felt like God was going to break his promise. That's what I felt like. I go, God, you brought us so far. You brought us five and a half years to break this promise now. <sighs> but what God wanted to do was so much bigger than what I wanted him to do. So... I usually don't cry during these things. I've actually shared this before and not cried, but not today. So, I cried for three days when I finally got to where I could cry. I cried for three days and we were we were not very prepared because we didn't know that we were going to be staying. We thought we we're going to find out what's wrong with Seth. We'll be coming home with him. But that was not the plan. And so um, what happened is I can't remember his name. Dr. Heim which was a hematologist. 
he is the specialist. And so he came and looked at the slide. And he said, yeah. He said, we believe, our team has looked at it. We believe that he has leukemia. But we don't know what type. And so me being the bold Christian, <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to pray that he doesn't. I said, because I don't want him to have it. And so that sweet doctor, so sweet, I'm sure he's gotten a lot worse reactions than that. He said, well, Mrs. Trotter, he said, I was the one on call, and they called me out of church. And he said, you don't know how many times I leave here praying that these kids don't have leukemia. And that made me feel kind of bad, but anyway, that's, that's how I felt. So I cried for three days. And I was freezing half the time because they keep the hospital so close. And like I said, we had the clothes on our backs, and that's it. We didn't have phone chargers. We didn't have anything that you would need for an extended stay at a hospital. We did not. We didn't pack a bag. We didn't, you know, because we did not think that we would be staying. <laughs> But he told us, Dr. Hum said, we are going to admit Seth immediately. He said, it is, um, he has had it for a while, and it has progressed a lot. And so all those times that Seth was sick, all those times that Seth was in pain, and I was giving him ibuprofen, I was driving down his platelets, I did not know. I didn't know that that is the wrong thing to do. I do now. I know a lot more about leukemia than I ever wanted to know. And so they admitted Seth, and the next day he had surgery because he had to have a port put in, and he had they had to take a chip out of his hip bone so that they could find out what kind of leukemia he had. And at the same time, his spinal fluid was treated with chemo just to keep it at bay. And so that's what we did on day two of our going to Cook's. We did that on day two. And I was devastated because that was not my plan for Seth. My plan for Seth was school at Glen Rose. I had finally gotten him into school at Glen Rose. I was so happy. That was what I felt like God wanted us to do. And so this wasn't my plan. And so I had a pity party for three days. Then I met, I met God on the bench in front of the hospital. I needed to thaw out. I was freezing to death. And so I met him at that bench. And I felt so helpless, as helpless as I did when I miscarried Isaiah. But I knew, oh my, that's running out of battery too. Everything's running out of battery. I unplugged my computer earlier because of the storm. Okay. I have, I'm nearly done, but I have a lot of good, good points still to make. So I met with God. I said, God, I can't heal him. I don't know anything about leukemia. I don't I don't I know nothing about this. And uh so I placed him in God's hands. And I said, God, whatever whatever it takes, whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes. This is yours. I can't do this. You brought me to the best place for this. I can't, you know, this is yours. So I gave up that day, and I gave it over to God, which it, it always was God's. It always was. And so, um, so these are the lessons that I learned while Seth had leukemia. Um, 
I feel like God appointed and anointed all of our medical teams. And we had many. We had many medical teams because we had cardiology involved and we had chemo and we had radiation and we had um, surgeries. We had a lot of things involved in this. So everybody that worked with Seth all the medical teams, the surgical teams. I feel like God appointed them specifically for Seth and anointed them to do their jobs. And so this is what I learned. I learned to praise Him in all things. Praise God in all things. We can praise God in the storm. We can. Um, nothing's too hard for God. Nothing's too hard for God. And great is his faithfulness. And so Jesus met us in the valley and climbed, I lost, and climbed every step of the way up the mountain with us. Some days he carried us because it was too hard. He was with us on the mountaintop when we were praising him. There were times when God, Seth, and I were the only ones in the room in the bone marrow transplant unit. So I skipped, I skipped some. I need to backtrack a little bit. Okay, so after I turned everything over to God, Seth immediately started having chemo. They would bring us these pieces of paper that had all this stuff on there about the side effects and the things, but you're trying to save your child. So you're signing off and dating on stuff that you don't know how it's going to affect your child later on. I really think that we are seeing some of the side effects from some of those chemos right now in Seth's uh, learning disabilities. But he's alive. He's alive. And so I'm not going to complain. So we had chemo. We had chemo when they tested him again, tested his uh, spinal tap fluid, still had leukemia for like two or three weeks. He still had leukemia. And then finally he got in remission. But, you know, they still had to do chemo on him. So he had chemo for three months from June the 14th until sometime in September, maybe the 1st of September. So maybe two and a half months he had chemo. All different types, all different types. And that was really hard too. And Seth, Seth always had a smile. Seth did not like what the nurses would do but they would come back later and he always had a smile for them because that's just his personality he has a beautiful personality he has a beautiful soul he really does so after that they decided to call us in to the to a doctor's appointment and they said, we believe that, again, winter was coming. And they go, we believe that Seth's body is getting weaker and weaker all the time with all the chemo. So we would like to do another thing. We would like to do an alternative treatment. And I'm like, mama bear. I'm like, I don't want to do it. They go, we want to do a bone marrow transplant. And I go, I don't want to do that. That's very drastic. It's very drastic. They take the kids nearly to death before they build them back up. Very drastic. Very, very drastic. And they had already talked to us, you know, about it. And I was like, mm, I don't want to do that. One person has to stay with Seth all the time, only one parent in the room at a time. We couldn't stay there as a family like we had been at the hospital. We had just been sleeping on the 
fold out couch, you know, Ricky and I. It was very uncomfortable, but we had been doing that. So again, I did not want to do this. I did not want to do this. And I fought. But after they talked to us, within two weeks, they had found two perfect matches for Seth. Now, we weren't a match. Neither one of us was a match. My daughter is a half-sibling. She wasn't a match. So we didn't have any familial matches. So... In the data bank, in the bone marrow, uh, the cord blood bank, they found two perfect matches. And so I still didn't want to do it. I was still arguing because that's what I do best. I argue. And so as I would drive back and forth to Fort Worth, because I was working too. I was working on the weekends at the Promise. And I would go during the week and I would... You know, we would, um, they were very good to work with me. And my employees were very good to be able to carry the ball while I wasn't there. And then I would work on the weekends when it was the hardest. But as my traveling back and forth through Benbrook to go to Cook's, there was this billboard that said, nothing's too hard for God. And I would look at that and I'd go, yeah, I know that. I know nothing's too hard for God. I don't want to do this. It's drastic. I've heard that people have had bone marrow transplants. They haven't worked. And um, I didn't want to do it. My husband did, of course. He's always on the opposite side when it comes to medical stuff. God has to convince me because I'm very hard-headed. And so, because God's God, just about three blocks down the road, the exact same billboard. Nothing's too hard for God. And so I go, okay, I still don't want to do this. And so what convinced me is that a late, my husband went to church here in Glenrose, and a lady was there with her family. Well, her granddaughter was in the bone marrow transplant. So my husband brought her to our house. You know, God sent a lady to my house. God sent a lady to my house. That's how hard-headed I am. So I talked to her, and she did make me feel better. And her granddaughter was fixing to get out, which, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And so that morning before that lady came, I had been listening to music, and great is thy faithfulness came on and I was like God you are faithful you have been faithful why do I doubt that you can't be faithful through this and then that lady came to my house so we decided to do it and Seth had to go for like a week of intensive testing before we could be admitted into the bone marrow transplant and you can't be sick. Your family members cannot be sick for you to be in there because those kids don't have any immunity. It is it is hard to be in there. You're washing your hands all the time. You're changing your clothes. Anyway, but we made it through that. And so he had his bone marrow transplant on September the 21st of 2009. And he did really well, but there was one day... But I was there by myself, and even the doctor was concerned about Seth. But he, he made a turnaround, and he, he did great. He really did. And um, so from, from beginning to finish of our stay, of Seth's stay, and he got to come home one time during this time, and I don't remember how long we stayed, but on his birthday, on August the 25th, we got to come home, and he got to have a milkshake. He couldn't socialize at all while he was taking chemo, so we were social isolation. I know what that's like. 
because I've done that. I've done it before. So I just like went right back into when uh, COVID came. I, I knew what to do. Anyway, but from beginning to finish of Seth's stay at Cook's, and it was off and on, and we did spend some time at Ronald McDonald House sometimes too, just so he would be close to the hospital if he got sick, uh, was June 14th through December the 4th of 2009. And so, what the treatment for leukemia is, is three and a half years of chemo, off and on, in and out of the hospital, some radiation. So through the cord blood transplant that our son received, God gave us a tremendous gift of time. He shaved off three years of treatment through that. And I know I'm hard-headed and I probably could have done it sooner, but that's just the way I work. And God knows that. He loves me. Even though I am hard-headed, He loves me through it. So let me finish this. So Seth showed us the nurses and the doctors with his beautiful smile. My son used to have blonde hair. I know a lot of people don't realize that, but he had blonde hair before he got sick. And now he has brown hair like us. But he had beautiful blonde hair and beautiful blue eyes. But apparently this transplant changed his eyes because now they're brown. They're not blue like they were but that's okay, we still love him. Anyway, he, his beautiful smile, the forgiveness and love of Jesus, over and over again, I saw that on my child towards these people that in his mind, because he didn't understand, thought they were torturing him, but he had the love and the forgiveness of Jesus and a hug and a beautiful smile for them every time they came back. Now, he wasn't smiling much when they were there doing what they were doing. So they could come back five minutes later and he'd just be smiling at them because that's who God made Seth to be. And so we felt the prayers and support of so many people, our families and friends, our church family, my promised family that I worked with, and their families. So I praise Jesus that Seth is still in remission and has been for, for like 11 years now. This was eight and a half years. I know and have no doubt that God keeps his promises. No matter how big or small it is, hard to let go and let God, no matter how big or small, it is hard to let go and let God with our children. But trust is what he requires. God requires trust. You know, I'm probably going to have to do a second a second one of these because I'm already an hour. So I'm going to talk to you tomorrow about who do you trust. But this, this that I'm sharing with you tonight is when my trust started building so much. So much. Because this was so big. It was such a big thing. So Seth's ministry in life is hugs and love, and he has plenty for everyone. So Seth is my specific promise from God to fit his plan. You know, God has a plan for Seth. So this brings me to my final point that I want to make. And it is by far the most important and is eternal. So I ended this with an invitation for salvation. So I don't have to do that tonight because I'm fixing to do it. I wonder if I can put this over here. Okay, so Jesus is our promise from God. Jesus was promised all through God's word that he was coming, that he was the promised one. You know, I worked for Promise Productions, and I worked for the Promise England Rose. There is, you know, that was not a coincidence. 
it was God's design. And God fulfills his promise. And God sent Jesus to save the world and not condemn it. So he didn't send Jesus to call us all out on our sin, because we all have sin. He sent Jesus with compassion and love and forgiveness to save us. To save us from our sin, because sin is bondage. Sin is not what it seem, what it starts out to be. It gets really, 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 really bad after a while. Okay, so if you have John 3.16 memorized, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I really like the verse following. If you have it memorized, say it with me. If not, I will read it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3:17. God wants the whole world in heaven. You know, I, I say that a lot on here. Jesus died for the whole world, like used to be 7 billion people, but I hear it's 7.8 billion. And sometimes I hear it's 8 billion, so I have no idea. I have not done the census of the world. So uh, between 7.5 billion and 8 billion people. Jesus died for every one of them. Every one of us. The love of God for us and for the whole world is so tremendous so deep, so wide, and everlasting. Jesus is the only path to God, and the ultimate promise from God is heaven. Jesus is the example that we have for love and compassion. The love of Jesus is like 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, I'm just going to read like this, um, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is how Jesus loves us and how we are to love others. Um, Jesus came and lived on this earth withstanding the same temptations we face daily. He left this earth perfect. Jesus came as a humble man, showed love and compassion, but he, st he will return as King Jesus. His love for us has never changed and will never change. He promised his disciples before he ascended that he was going to prepare a place for us, for them, and for us too. He also promised that he would return to get his church and usher them into heaven. He is there right now preparing a place for us, a place in his kingdom. So 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us why Jesus has not returned yet. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This promise has not, fulfill, has not been fulfilled. Jesus has not returned yet. But if all promises in the Bible have been fulfilled, this one will be also. Everything we have in this world is temporary, but Jesus is building an eternal kingdom for us to live and reign with him forever. We must receive Jesus. He is our promise from God. Are you ready to receive Jesus as your Savior? Are you ready to receive the promises that God has for you in his life? In order to get to our ultimate promise, 
We must accept Jesus. He is the only path to God. Out of all the decisions that we make in our lives, this is the only one that lasts forever and is the most important. Choose Jesus as your Savior. If you have strayed away from Jesus, then return to him today. He is waiting with his arms stretched wide open, and he loves you today as you are. Do not wait. A day is coming when it will be too late. Thank you for letting me share this message with you today. I made this video to a song that really speaks to my soul about the promises of God. I love the lyrics to this. And so then I invited our preacher's wife to come and do, you know, ask people if they wanted to be saved. But I believe everyone at Our Lady's Tea was saved. So are you saved tonight? Is Jesus your Savior? As I try to get all my papers together. It's crazy. I'm not going to do the teleprompter thing anymore. That was fun. Still won't stay. Alright, there went all my pencils too. Woo, fun. It's going to be fun to clean up. Okay. Well, thank you for indulging me. Um, with my testimony. Um, my testimony is very long. This is just part of it. But this was a part where I really had to trust God. I really just had to let go. And I've had to do that many times in my life. Just let go and let God because I can't do it. And uh, I'm thankful that I did because He showed me a lot of very important life lessons and something that I didn't say is that once I did turn all this over to God I started praying for other parents and other kids and I still know a lot of them now and they they are survivors too so my son is a leukemia survivor and uh, he is a very strong young man and he's 17 now this happened to him when he was five and a half. So, he will soon be 18 in August. In four months, he will be 18. Alright, so I found some different ways to do the salvation message. I thought. I thought I did. I don't know what I did with them. Hmm. Well, not only that, I found a lot of money, too, in my ministry bag. But I thought, well, maybe not. Okay. Well, I think I'm just going to do a prayer, because I did share some scripture about, oh, maybe it's over here. All right, we'll do it later. Because this is nearly taking an hour and 30 minutes. So thank you for hanging in there with me. I didn't get anything else done. I didn't read to you what I did on Facebook. I guess I'll do that tomorrow. I didn't read this. It's God and I have been having some really good conversations about trust. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday. Okay, maybe tomorrow. Okay, so this is a prayer. If you would... If you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, then repeat these words after me. I will leave a space for you. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you are God's one and only Son. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You were buried for three days and rose from the dead. I believe you ascended to heaven and are preparing a place for me. I 
I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart in my life. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Clean my heart and help me to glorify you. In your name I pray. Amen. So if you did accept Jesus as your Savior, then welcome to the kingdom family of God. The angels are rejoicing, and your name is being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are now saved, sealed, and sanctified by God through Jesus, His Son. And so you can start your Christianity journey. Today is day one. Do read God's Word every day and pray and praise. I didn't even turn any music on tonight. I don't know. All right, well... Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And uh, get off of here. I need to go feed my son. I need to go feed Seth, my son. Um, I don't know if I have any pictures over there. They probably have dust on them. Yeah, that's when Seth was sick. See if I can find some pictures to show you. Maybe tomorrow. Okay, well, let's pray. Let us pray. God, we just come to you and we thank you because we know that you do keep all of your promises, God. That you are faithful, that we can trust you with everything that we have. Even our children, we need to just place them in your hands, God. Because you have a plan and purpose for them, and you created them also. You are their creator. You are their sustainer. You are their provider. You are their protector. And we have a job to do also for our children. We are the ones that need to. You put us in charge of caring for them and for teaching them about you too, which is most important. God, I just pray for anyone that's out there that is sick, God, that you would heal their bodies. And I just pray, God, for all the many blessings, for all the answered prayers, God, when Seth was sick, all the answered prayers going forward, God, even when you said no, God, I thank you for that because as we get farther down the road, we see why. And God, I just pray if there's anybody out there that needs to know that they can trust you, God, that they will listen to this story that the Holy Spirit helped me write three years ago and that they would know that they can trust you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, my friend Josie did not. She said she was having trouble with her phone. She does not come and listen, but that's okay. She will when she can. I want to thank you again for listening tonight. I know it was long and it was probably drawn out, but maybe it was for someone out there. I'm sorry I got emotional. I normally don't. I'm extremely strong, but... I don't know. I've kind of been, um, I watched something spiritually this morning about youth, something that I want to, I want us to take our youth to, and it just really impacted me very hardly, very, very much, not very hardly, very much, um, about all the things that our youth have been confronted with the past two years. I mean, it's been hard for us as adults because I have never been through anything like what we have been through. And, but I can't imagine being youth and being impacted by all these things. Um, and some of them having Jesus as their Savior and some of them not. So I just, um, I really want to be able to take them 
to this event in Fort Worth. So we discussed it today. I looked up some information. The tickets are free. I really like that. That is the right price that I'm willing to make a donation to because I know that they can't set everything up for free. All right, well, I'm going to get off of here. I did pray. Uh, let me do God's blessing for you. Okay, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee um, and be gracious to thee. I want to memorize this. I want to just be able to, I watch this guy and he just, like, he's got it memorized. It's so much better. Um, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Wow, we need peace. There's not a lot of peace in the Middle East. There's not a lot of peace all over the world. So we need peace. We need the peace through Jesus Christ. We don't need a false peace. We need a real peace. We need revival. I'm thinking revival a lot lately too. I know not all pastors like to do it, but I think we need a revival. I really do in our communities. We need revival. All right. Well, I am getting off of here. So much love. Much love. Much love. Much love. Much love. And cyber hugs. Till I see you again. Good night.